We are incapable of living the Christian life in our own power and our own strength. Somewhere in his journey, in his pilgrimage, Paul came to learn that. I don't think it was an easy lesson for him to learn because he was a highly motivated, highly driven, highly dedicated religious zealot. And he was used to putting his will and mind and heart and energy into everything that he pursued. And to come to the realization, wherever it came and however it came, that this Christian life that he knew to be true couldn't be lived in his power and strength must have been a cathartic moment for him. It is not that scripture is the problem. It's that we are the problem. Our flesh, our sin nature. Scripture rightly and truthfully says, do this and you will live. The only problem is that we can't do it. Therefore, we don't live. The commandment meant to bring us life is holy and righteous and good. The problem is that we are not. Fortunately, that is not the end of the story. It is only half of the story. It's an important half of the story for this reason. That there are many along the way who trust Christ for their salvation and recognize that their works are incapable of saving them. Who go on from that point to try to live the Christian life in their own strength and their own power. Paul dispels this once and for all in his honest, truthful, transparent disclosure. I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. What a wretched man that I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? That's not the whole story. So he immediately goes on to answer his own question. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ. But notice he doesn't end on that triumphal note. Did you notice that? (laughs) That's why it's good to turn scripture over in your mind and heart as you meditate on it. Why does he say, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord, and go right on into chapter 8? Why does he come back to what is the central point of chapter 7 to say again, So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. It's because he doesn't want the main point lost. He doesn't want to allow that note of victory to obscure the central point of chapter 7 that prepares us for chapter 8, that we are incapable in our own power and strength to fulfill the law. We cannot do it. Why is that important? Because you cannot appreciate the importance of chapter 8 unless you appreciate the importance of chapter (laughs) 7. Now he can come to the other half of the story. Romans chapter 8 is one of the greatest passages in all of Scripture. It has been described as being to Scripture what the Holy of Holies was to the temple or what the Tree of Life was to the Garden of Eden the greatest passage in maybe the greatest book of the Bible. It is one of the most hopeful, triumphant passages in all of Scripture. Griffith Thomas, a great English Bible teacher, summed it up like this. He said, the chapter begins with no condemnation. It ends with no separation, while in between there is no defeat. It is the theme of victory, of victorious Christian living. Here's a significant fact. There's not one single imperative in the whole chapter. Not a single command. It is all indicative. It is all a description of what God has done, is doing, and will do through the work of the Holy Spirit. And that is the subject of the chapter, life in the Spirit. In chapter 7, the law is referred to 31 times while the Holy Spirit is mentioned once. In chapter 8, the Holy Spirit is referred to 19 times in 27 verses. It is the work of the Holy Spirit that is now front and center in chapter 8. And chapter 7 has laid 
the groundwork for that. The chapter opens with a triumphant declaration. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He begins with a statement of absolute, unqualified assurance. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Both the now in that sentence and the no are emphatic. That is, grammatically, they're placed and used in such a way to make them emphatic. And it would read something like this if we were to give it its sense. From now on, there is not any condemnation, none at all, for those who are in Christ Jesus. The reality of this ongoing sin nature which Paul has honestly and transparently described in chapter 7, that each and every one of us know to be absolutely true. In our ongoing struggle, our daily struggle, is neither final nor determinative. Let me say that one more time. The reality of our ongoing sin nature, that we dwell in now is neither final nor determinative. We are not condemned for that or because of that. That's the struggle, that's the struggle of faith that often comes to a new believer after the flush of that initial experience of forgiveness and Cleansing and joy and the the joy of sins forgiven, of the status of righteousness. The, the, The day that the morning comes when that person wakes up and realizes, you know what, I still have a struggle with sin. And those first occasions of failure, which bring back that sense of condemnation. Maybe I didn't receive everything I thought I received there. Maybe I'm not okay. And so it is just fascinating to me that Paul, in his, follows immediately what he describes in chapter 7 with that amazing statement of unqualified, absolute assurance. There is now not any condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We are not condemned because of our need for sanctification, nor because we are in the process of our sanctification, which Paul clearly recognizes. There is now not any condemnation at all. Whatever our struggles, whatever our shortcomings, whatever our failures, no condemnation. And here's why. Verse 2. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. We have been set free from the law of sin and death by the law of the Spirit that gives life, or the the law, this is the phrase, the law of the life-giving Spirit. What does he mean by that? What does Paul mean by the law of the life-giving Spirit? Are there two laws? Is this a a law that is different than the law of sin and death? No. There's only one law. It stands written. Those were Jesus' words as he would quote it. It stands written. One law. He said in the Sermon on the Mount, I tell you that not one yoth or tittle will disappear from the law until everything is fulfilled. Don't think that I've come to, to do away with the law. I came to fulfill it. Not the smallest Hebrew letter, not the smallest little vocabulary or uh, grammatical dash will, be, will disappear from the law until all of it is fulfilled. Same law. Different means, different ends. 
The law of sin and death, the law of the life-giving spirit. That's the, the contrast. Same law, different means, different ends. The law of sin and death, trying in our own strength, power to do the law, weakened by our flesh, our sin nature, failing, producing death. The law of the life-giving spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, the third person of the divine trinity, dwelling inside of us, filling us, empowering us, enabling us to do the law truly, authentically, from the inside out, and producing life. Same law, different means, different ends. Empowering us and enabling us to do this. A power greater than our sin nature, enabling us to live a new life over and above our sin nature. We say that again. A power greater than our sin nature, enabling us to live a new life over and above our sin nature. Same law. Different means, different ends. The law does not work. Does not work. Law keeping in our own strength does not work. It never did. It never will. That's why there is a new covenant. Why did God say to Jeremiah and Ezekiel, I'm going to do a new covenant if the old covenant was sufficient. That's why there's an Old Testament and a New Testament. What does the word testament mean? Same word for covenant. That's what it means. Old covenant, new covenant. We have that division in our Bibles. Same law. One law. One book. Two covenants. One old, one new. One unsatisfactory, a new one given in its place. So God declares through the prophet Jeremiah, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel. I will put their law, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And then through the prophet Ezekiel, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. It's not the same flesh that Paul's referring to in Romans. That's a heart that is responsive, that is malleable. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and to be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live, he says. Same law, Different means. I will write that law on your hearts by my spirit. Different ends. Life. That is why we have been set free from the law of sin and death. It didn't work. It doesn't work. It will never work. And here's how God did it. Verse 3. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did, God did. Let's just stop right there. What the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, by our sin nature, God did. (laughs) 
What did he do? Five distinct and important aspects of his work that's tightly packed in these verses. That's why we're only taking the, the first four verses. First of all, he sent his own son. Verse 3. God did by sending his own son. He didn't send just anyone. He didn't just send a prophet. He sent his own son. His very best. His very most. His very dearest. Just ponder that for a moment. Don't let the familiar, familiarity dull you to the significance. In order to accomplish that, he sent his own son. Ponder the greatness of what he did, the magnitude of what he did. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He sent his own son, secondly, in the likeness of sinful flesh. Verse 3 again. God did this by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Not in the likeness of flesh, implying that he was, wasn't fully human. That's what it would mean to say just simply in the likeness of flesh. And that has been a, that's been a heresy since the first century. That's always made its, its rounds. Not in the likeness of flesh, implying that he wasn't fully human or that he did not take on full humanity. Paul says clearly, and the words are very important, in the likeness of sinful flesh. Emphasizing that in taking on our full humanity, he did not take on our fallen nature. Fully human, yet absolutely sinless. He sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, thirdly, to be a sin offering. Verse 3 again. God did this by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. He offered his perfect, sinless humanity as an offering of atonement for the sins of all humanity, past, present, and future. Every sin of everyone that ever have been or ever will be committed. It is already atoned for. It is finished. That's, uh, I think that's one of the things that uh, is difficult for us to comprehend and accept and receive is that we think that from the moment that we are converted that all of those sins have been forgiven. <laughs> but now what about having come to a knowledge of my sin and of my Savior and of what Christ did, what about the sins post? So one of the advantages of church history is understanding all of the things that began to go haywire from very, very early on. And now sins past that were already cleansed and done away with, sins future had to be atoned for ourselves through penitential practices in a penitential system. So you had to say so many certain kind of prayers in order to atone for a sin at this level. But that's not what scripture teaches. That When he atoned for the sins, when he took his perfect humanity and offered it an atonement for all of humanity, it was for all of the sins, past, present, and future. When he cried out on the cross, it is finished. It was finished. It was done. There was nothing that could ever possibly be added to that. Every sin of everyone 
ever committed or ever will be committed. Already atoned for. Fourthly, God condemns sin in the flesh. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering, and so he condemned sin in the flesh. He bore the full condemnation of our sins. He took on all of our sins. He took on all of our guilt. He he bore all of our punishment. He took all of our condemnation, the complete guilt and punishment of our sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us. Why can Paul declare at the beginning there is now no condemnation? He bore all the condemnation. There is no more condemnation to be born. It has already been condemned fully and completely. There's nothing that remains. Now, to what end or purpose, fifthly, to what end or purpose, verse 4. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. God did, this is what God did, sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering in order that he might condemn sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit. That is the goal, intent, and purpose of everything which he, which God did in Christ. Holiness Personal holiness is the ultimate purpose of the incarnation and the atonement. Does that make sense? The reason God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh for sin to condemn sin in the flesh was not just for our justification. It was for our sanctification. Not just to free us from the condemnation of the law, but to free us to the obedience of the law. To deliver us from the power of our sin nature by the power of the life-giving Holy Spirit so that we might fully fulfill his law. That was his purpose and intent. Let me just say that again, that holiness is the ultimate purpose of the incarnation and atonement. It's the end. The Holy Spirit which dwells in us is more powerful than the sin nature in which we dwell. Greater is he that is in you. He sent not just his own son, he sent his own spirit, which is the only way that we can be holy, by his indwelling Holy Spirit, because of him. Because of what Christ did for you and because of what the Holy Spirit does for you, You have the power and the ability to do what your sinful nature could never, ever do. To live not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. To put to death the deeds of your sinful nature. To live a new life in newness of life in greater and greater love for God and others. Becoming increasingly Christ-like. Increasingly demonstrating the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against which there is no law. Loving God, loving others in ever-increasing measure. Authentically, from the inside out. Now, There are two prevalent errors when it comes to trying to live the Christian life in the reality of our flesh, our sin nature. There are two prevalent errors. 
legalism, and license. You may be familiar with those terms. C.S. Lewis once wisely observed that Satan always sends air in pairs so that we get so concerned about one thing that we back into the other. Some fall into legalism. Legalism is the attempt now, having been justified by faith, to live the Christian life in our own strength and power. By the letter, by external conformity, to certain chosen standards in our own strength and power. And Paul will ask this question to the Galatians, to the Galatian Christians, after beginning by the means of the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the means of the flesh, by your your fallen nature? Some fall into that. That's legalism. Others wanting to avoid legalism fall into license. That is unrighteous, unholy living that it doesn't really matter how we live. Grace abounds. The greater the sin, the greater the grace. Neither are life-giving. Both are death-producing. The answer to legalism is not license. The answer to both legalism and license is life in the Spirit. Transformed, changed from the inside out by His Holy Spirit indwelling us. Let me just underscore again the importance of the indicative. You know what indicative means grammatically? It means just the description. It's not a command. So all of Paul's epistles for at least half of each letter begin with the indicative. Not with what we're supposed to do, but but with what God has already done. So you take Ephesians for an example, three chapters of very dense unfolding of everything that God has done before he finally comes in chapter four, verse one to say, therefore, live a life worthy of your calling. He doesn't come to the imperative, the command, until he has fully laid out what God did first. And so in the book of Romans, we're not going to come. When are we going to come to the imperative? Anybody know? Where does the first real imperative come in the book of Romans? Chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. (laughs) That's everything that Paul has expounded in the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans. And then finally, in chapter 12, verse 1, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. That's the first imperative. So we never begin with the commands. We begin with what God has done. And only after God, what God has done and what God has established, then do we come to our response and our responsibility to live a life worthy of what he's done. But we're to live what he's done. And the purpose for which he has done it. More of that to follow in Romans 8. Here's a verse worth tucking away in your memory. Here's, here's a verse worth memorizing. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. May God himself, Paul writes, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. I love that. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. 
Amen. <laughs> Amen. Let's pray together. Father, I pray for whoever might come under the hearing of this word now or later that they might know that the place that that begins is in our surrender and trust in you at the foot of your cross where we lay down our vain treasures and our vain attempts to attain what we think are worthwhile things in submission to you as our Lord and God and King. That's where it begins. You have done marvelous things, marvelous things, not only to secure our escape from the judgment and condemnation of sin, but to escape from the the power of sin in our lives. And how grateful we are for that. I pray that we might grasp in just a greater depth and extent the truth that there is now no condemnation. That whatever our ongoing struggles and our pilgrimage and journey, whatever we're struggling with today, whatever shortcomings, whatever failures, have already been atoned for completely. That you, Lord Jesus, on our behalf, bore our condemnation, all of it, from the beginning of our lives until the end. And that we are secure in you. That security is not to give us complacency. It's that out of a out of the sheer wonder and gratitude of what you done, you have done, that we might live our lives through the power of your Holy Spirit in a way that pleases you and honors you. Not out of fear, not out of guilt, out of love and gratitude for what you've done and accomplished on our behalf. We thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for changing us from the inside out. We thank you for giving us the ability to do what we could never do so that we might be free, free in you. Help us to do that, we pray. Sanctify us more and more, we ask. Help us to rely and trust upon you, just as we did in the beginning by faith, to trust you by faith now for that deeper, greater work that will continue until the day that we stand before you. We thank you for that. Bless now our time of communion and our fellowship with you. Grace this table with your presence. Feed every heart and soul, dear Jesus. Through your life-giving spirit, through the life that you've given, we receive you. Come now, we pray. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, and after he had given thanks, he said, This cup is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for the sins of many. Drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. If you're in fellowship with him, trusted him, then he invites you to come. God bless you as you do. Mm